This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. We are but days away from the beginning of Lent, and it seems to me that we should remind ourselves periodically as we approach Lent, now just 10 days away, that Lent is a time of penance, that we must pay for our sins. And in paying for our sins, we should also focus on breaking those sins which we fall into, those vices we all have. You know, confessors, priests who really are dedicated to the sacrament of reconciliation or penance, however you think of it, those priests will often talk about how most people go to confession for the same one or two sins, without fail. And, and by the same one or two, I mean each person has one or two or three things that they fall into repeatedly. Whether they're sins of the flesh or sins of omission, whatever it is, people tend to have one or two things that they're drawn to that they wrestle with their whole lives. And here you are going to hear from St. John Vianney that you cannot count on a last-minute sort of interior conversion and penitential state, and not because that you may suddenly, you know, have an unexpected, untimely end, but because it could very well be that you have been abandoned already in your sins. This is a recurring theme among the doctors and saints of the church. This is why I suspect in our time so many people make little use of confession. It's not because of hard sermons like this, but because now we hear that you can just keep use of the sacrament of penance over and over and over again without repercussion. We are being led astray in our time, at least if St. John Vianney is right, and St. Saint Saint Lawrence of Port Maurice, and numerous, numerous other saints who tell us that we should not you know, live in our sins, that we should not accept the sins that we have, these ha bad habits that send us to the confession over and over again. So make this Lent count. Make it so that your focus is not only on giving up the couple little things you do, but a little extra prayer, more penance, take the fasting more seriously, go to confession weekly, and wrestle with those habitual sins, whatever they are. There are a whole host of habitual sins. People tend to think of one impurity, sin. But no, there's a whole host of them. With that, with that, with what I've said on your mind, the much more eloquent words of St. John Vianney on a bad death. The Bad Death, Sermon of St. John Mary Vianney. If you ask me what most people understand by a bad death, I will reply, When a person dies in the prime of life, married, enjoying good health, having wealth in abundance, and leaves children and a wife desolate, there is no doubt but that such a death is very tragic. King Ezekiel said, what, my God, it is necessary that I die in the midst of my years, in the prime of my life. And the prophet king asks God not to take him in his prime. Others say that to die at the hands of the executioner on the gallows is a bad death. Others say that a sudden death is a bad death, as, for instance, to be ended in some disaster, or to be drowned, or to fall from a high building, or into perish. And then some say that the worst thing is to die of some horrible affliction, or some other wicked malady. And yet, my dear brethren, I am going to tell you that none of these are bad deaths, provided that a person has lived well. If he dies in his prime, his death will not fail to be valuable in God's eyes. We have many saints who died in the prime of their lives. It is not a bad death, either, to die at the hands of the executioner. All the martyrs died at the hands of such men. To, deny, to die a sudden death is not to die a bad death, either, provided one is ready. We have many saints who died deaths of that sort. St. Simeon was ended by lightning on his pillar. St. Francis de Sales died of apoplexy. Finally, to die of the plague is not a dreadful death. St. Roach and St. Francis Xavier died of it. But what makes death bad is sin. Ah, this horrible sin which tears and devours at this dread moment. Alas, no matter where the poor and fortunate sinner looks, he sees only in sin and neglected graces. If he lifts his eyes to heaven, he sees only an angry God, armed with all the fury of his justice, who is ready to punish him. 
If he turns his gaze downwards, he sees only hell and its furies already opening its gates to receive him. Alas, this poor sinner did not want to recognize the justice of God during his life on earth. At this moment, not only does he see it, but he feels it already pressing down upon him. During his lifetime, he was always trying to hide his sins, at least to make as little of them as possible. But at this moment, everything is shown to him as in broad light of day. He sees now what he should have seen before, what he did not want to see. He would like to weep for his sins, but he has no more time. He scorned God during his lifetime. God now in his turn scorns him and abandons him to despair. Listen, hardened sinners, you who are wallowing now with such pleasure in the slime of your vice, without casting even a thought upon amending your lives. Who perhaps will give thought to this only when God has abandoned you, as has happened to people less guilty than you? Yes, the Holy Ghost tells us that sinners in their last moments will gnash their teeth, will be seized by a horrible dread at the very thought of their sins. Their iniquities will rise up before them and accuse them. Alas, they will cry at this dread moment. Alas, of what use is this pride, this vain ostentation, and all those pleasures we have been enjoying in sin? Everything is finished now. We have not a single item of virtue to our credit, but have been completely conquered by our evil passions. This is exactly what happened to the unhappy Antiochus, who, when he fell from his chariot, shattered his whole body. He experienced such dreadful pain in his entrails that it seemed to him as if someone were tearing them out. The worm started to nod him while he was still alive, and his whole body stank like carrion. Then he began to open his eyes. This is what sinners do, but too late. Ah, he cried, I realize now that it was the evils which I committed in Jerusalem that are tormenting me now and gnawing at my heart. His body was consumed by the most frightful sufferings, and his spirit was an inconceivable sadness. He got his friends to come to him, thinking that he might find some consolation in them. But no, abandoned by God, who gives consolation, he could not find it in others. Alas, my friends, he said to them, I have fallen into a terrible affliction. Sleep has left me. I cannot rest for a single instant. My heart is pierced with grief. To what a terrible state of sadness and anguish I am reduced. It seems that I must die of sorrow, and in a strange country too. Ah, Lord, pardon me. I will repair all the evil that I have done. I will pay back all that I have taken from the temple in Jerusalem. I will present great gifts to the temple. I will become one of your chosen. I will observe the law of Moses. I will go about publicizing the omnipotence of God. Ah, Lord, have mercy on me. Please. But his illness increased, and God, whom he had scorned during his life, no longer had ears to hear him. He was a proud man, a blasphemer, and despite his urgent prayers, he was not listening to and had to go to perdition. It was a grievous but a just punishment that sinners who throughout their lives have spurned all the graces which God has offered them find no more graces when they would like to profit by them. Alas, the number of people who die thus in the sight of God is great. Alas, that there are so many of these blind people who do not open their eyes until the moment when there are no further remedies for their ills. Yes, my dear brethren, yes, a life of sin and a death of rejection. You are in sin and you do not wish to give it up. No, you say very well, my children, you will perish in sin. You will see that in the death of Voltaire, the notorious blasphemer. Listen carefully and you will see that if we despise God always, and if God waits for us during our lives, often by a just judgment, he will abandon us at the hour of our death, when we would like to return to him. The idea that one can live in sin and give it all up one day is one of the devil's traps which will cause you to lose your soul as it has caused so many others to lose theirs. Voltaire, realizing that he was ill, began to reflect upon the state of the sinner, who dies with a conscience loaded with sins. He wished to examine his conscience and see whether God would be willing to pardon him all the sins of his life, which were very great in number. He counted upon the mercy of God, which is infinite, and with this comforting thought in mind, he had brought to him one of those priests whom he had so greatly outraged and calumniated in his writings. He threw himself upon his knees and made a declaration to him of his sins and put into his hands the recantation of all his impieties and his scandals. He began to flatter himself on having achieved the great work of his reconciliation. But he was gravely mistaken. God had abandoned him. You will see how. Death anticipated all spiritual help. Alas, this unfortunate blasphemer felt all his terrors reborn in him. He cried out, Alas, I, am I then abandoned by God and by men? Yes, unhappy man, you are. Already your lot and your hope are in perdition. Listen to this godless man. He cries out with that mouth sullen with so many profanities and so much blasphemy against God, his religion, and his ministers. Ah, he cried, Jesus Christ, Son of God, who died for all sinners without distinction, have pity on me. 
But alas, almost a century of blasphemy and impiety had exhausted the patience of God who had already rejected him. He was no more than a victim which the wrath of God fattens for the eternal flames. The priests whom he had so derided, but to whom in this moment he so desired, were not there. See him as he falls into convulsions and the horrors of despair. His eyes wild, his face ghastly, and his body trembling with terror. He twists and turns and torments himself and seems as if he wants to atone for all those previous blasphemies with which his mouth had been so often sullied. His companions in irreligion, fearing, lest someone might bring him the last sacrament, something which would have seemed to them to dishonor their cause, brought him to a house in the country, and there abandoned him to his despair. The sobering sermon from St. John Vianney. Many will wonder how possibly God could abandon someone who seems to be recanting of their sins, repenting at the very last moment. Sometimes you have to ask yourself, are people truly repenting? Was Voltaire in this account truly repenting? That is an open question. St. John Vianney, who could read souls, seems to think he was not. And Voltaire did famously die blaspheming. So, there is that. Again, I present this to you as we are but days away from the beginning of Lent. Let our penances be tr trying for us. Let us make the most of this Lent to pay for our sins. And if you have habitual sins in your life that you, for whatever reason, have such difficulty giving up, refocus this Lent. Try to make progress with them. And the only way you can make progress is through frequenting of the sacraments, through praying, and through fasting. Lent is the perfect time to get your spiritual house in order. Let's take it seriously. We have no idea how many more Lents we have for us. This may be, as individuals, or collectively, our last Lent. Let me know what you thought of this in the comments, please. Like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help, as does sharing this on social media. That helps, too. As always, pray for the Church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.